put that with a capital letter. This is lesson 13, classification of water surface profiles. In this lecture, we're going to be going through uh, the conceptual idea of water surface profiles. Uh, but before we go into that, I want to give you a brief review of uniform flow. Uniform flow is, is really an ideal. It's, uh, it's something that's asymptotically approached, but it's never truly obtained. And the reason for that is any non-uniformity in the channel, whether it be a bump or some kind of constriction or a slope change, all of these things affect the flow. And these disturbances will prevent uniform flow from occurring. And like a ripple that theoretically never goes away, the effects of these disturbances can be, although they'll decrease in magnitude, they can extend for a, a great distance upstream and downstream, and they change gradually. So what we actually observe in open channels is what we call gradually varied flow. Now, normal depth uh, we obtain from the Manning's equation. And uh, this was introduced to you in earlier lessons, but just as a, a quick review here, uh, Q is equal to 1.49 over N times A times R to the 2 thirds times the square root of the friction slope S sub F. And we see that the normal depth is sort of encapsulated in the area and hydraulic radius terms, A and R, okay? So, as a result of that, we see that the normal depth is a function of the discharge, the Manning's roughness, the slope, and the channel geometry. Critical depth, on the other hand, is computed using the Froude number, knowing that the Froude number is 1 at critical depth, and the Froude equation being V over the square root of G times D sub C. If we replace the V term with Q over A, we get Q over area times the square root of G times d sub c. And we see there that d sub c is, is contained in the area term. And so the critical depth, d sub c, is a function of discharge and channel geometry alone. Slope is not a factor in computing critical depth. The energy equation uh, from location 1 to location 2, of course, we've seen this all before, uh, v1 squared over 2g plus y1 plus z1 is equal to V2 squared over 2G plus Y2 plus Z2 plus H sub L, which is the, uh, the head loss or the friction losses and eddy losses between section 1 and 2. Well, for uniform flow, we know that V1 is equal to V2 and that Y1 is equal to Y2. So V1 squared over 2G plus Y1 is equal to V2 squared over 2G plus Y2, or in other words, the specific energy at point one is equal to the specific energy at point two. And that also means that Z1 is equal to Z2 plus the friction losses or other losses between sections one and two. Now if we rearrange that lower equation and divide by L, we get that Z1 minus Z2 over L is equal to H sub L over L, or that the slope of the bed is equal to the friction slope. And another way of stating that is that the rate of energy dissipation due to friction is equal to the slope of the channel bed. And these are all things that we know about uniform flow, but I'm just restating them here to keep our minds fresh on that. Now, I'd also like to do a quick review of specific energy because water surface profiles are best understood in relationship to specific energy. The shape of the specific, specific energy curve is constant for a given geometry. And the depth at the point of minimum energy is the critical depth d sub c. When you measure distances along the e axis, the distance between the d axis and the 45 degree line is the depth of flow d. And then the distance between the 45 degree line and the specific energy curve is the velocity head. The upper portion of the curve is the range of subcritical flow and the lower portion of the curve is supercritical. In the absence of any artificial disturbances, flow will be subcritical or supercritical depending on the slope of the channel. And for a given level of specific energy, there are two possible normal depths depending on the slope. In the graph in front of you, D1 is the normal depth for sub, excuse me, for supercritical flow, and D2 is the normal depth for subcritical flow. Physical controls or any disturbances can force flow away from normal depth, even into another flow regime. However, flow always wants to return to normal depth 
because this is the point of balanced energy, and normal depth will be dictated on, uh, based on the slope. The effects of the physical controls or disturbances can propagate, and they will propagate upstream for subcritical flow because control is at the downstream end, and they will propagate downstream for supercritical flow because control is at the upstream end. Now let's take a look at a channel and, and study the gradually varied flow in an open channel. The channel in front of you is, uh, has a constant cross section and it has a constant mild slope and it carries a discharge of Q. Now the slope of the, the image in front of you is, looks like it's fairly steep and that's because I needed just to narrow it down to fit on the screen. But assume that, that that's a mild slope and the normal depth then is going to be greater than the critical depth. And you see that as the two lines uh, that run parallel to the bed on the graph in front of you. The critical depth is above the bed and the normal depth is above the critical depth. Normal depth is greater than the critical depth because it's a mild slope and that implies that it's a subcritical flow regime. Now, when we introduce the sluice gate, let's look at that specifically for a moment. As the sluice gate is lowered, the upstream depth will change until the discharge under the gate equals the inflowing discharge. And that, of course, just satisfies the continuity equation. But why is that particularly true at the sluice gate? Well, the sluice gate forces an artificial condition of increased energy on the specific energy curve. Under the gate, flow is forced to be at a very shallow depth. And to maintain continuity, the velocity has to increase as a result. And flow is forced into the supercritical flow regime at this higher specific energy than what would be normal. Just upstream of the gate, flow will be at that same level of specific energy as it is under the gate, but it will be in the subcritical flow regime because of the mild slope. And so it will be at that higher depth, that alternate depth, uh, just upstream of the gate. Now, if we look upstream of the sluice gate, because the sluice gate causes flow to be at that higher depth and at a higher energy on the E-curve than is normal, as the depth increases on the E-curve, the velocity decreases, and as velocity decreases, the rate of energy dissipation is less than what is normal for in normal uniform flow. So the water surface and the energy grade line are flatter than the bed slope. Ultimately, the water surface and energy grade line are nearly horizontal at a point just upstream of the gate, and it's at a forced depth and a forced energy level on the energy uh, the specific energy curve, as you see there. Well, with mild slope, we have the subcritical flow regime. Control is at the downstream end, and the energy will want to return, will want to decrease, and D will want to return to normal. The water depth will decrease as we move upstream, approaching normal depth. This is called an M1 profile, and it's also termed a backwater effect. And these the effects of a backwater curve like this can propagate very far upstream. In fact, during the flood of 1993 on the Missouri River, uh, there were a few tributary streams that had effects that were seen as many as 20 and 30 miles upstream just because of the, uh, the, uh, the effect of the raised levels on the Missouri River. Well, let's take a look now downstream of the sluice gate. Well, the sluice forces the depth to be less than the normal depth, and the velocity is much greater than normal. The slope of the energy grade line is greater than the bed slope, and this indicates a decrease in energy as we move downstream. Well, as the depth is forced into the subcritical flow regime, the energy will want to decrease, and the D will want to return to normal. Well, this is going to follow what we would call an M3 profile. However, as the depth approaches the critical depth, a problem occurs. There's a point of critical depth and energy right there at the minimum energy and at, at critical depth, and, and this is an area that's very unstable. Small changes in energy result in some very uh, large variations in depth. The normal depth for the channel has some amount of energy in it, and the depth will not want to go through the point of, of minimum depth following the critical, uh, the, the specific energy curve. And so what happens is we get a hydraulic jump and the flow will shift from the supercritical flow regime to the subcritical flow regime with a loss of energy. 
Now, the amount of energy that will be lost depends on how close to normal depth the critical depth is, or how close to critical depth the normal depth is. If critical depth and normal depth are very close to one another, it usually means there'll be minimal loss and there'll be just a minor jump, like what you might see from a riffle to a pool along a stream, where the water just very gradually undulates into the normal depth uh, in the pool. However, if the normal depth to critical depth distance is, is great, you will have a massive loss of energy, and there'll be a major jump there, such as what you might see downstream of a high head dam or in, in some other form of spillway. Well, flow will be at normal depth in the subcritical flow regime downstream. And why is that true? Well, remember, in the absence of any disturbances, slope controls the flow regime. So assuming that there are no dis disturbances, flow wants to be at normal depth. Therefore, flow is at normal depth in that low, in that downstream flow regime, subcritical flow regime. Now, what would happen if somehow flow was artificially forced to point A or to point B? Well, it would want to return to normal depth unless something downstream forced it away from normal because downstream controls in subcritical flow. Well, we have such a situation occurring because flow goes over a brink at the very downstream end. And at the brink, flow would be at critical depth. We've talked about that in earlier lectures. With control uh, at the brink being critical, flow would want to return to normal as you proceed back upstream. And it would want to follow the en specific energy curve up to the normal depth as you move upstream. And this is what we call an M2 curve or an M2 profile. Now, what are these M1, M2, M3 curves, and why are they labeled that way? Well, profiles are categorized in terms of the bed slope. If we have a supercritical slope, we call that a steep slope, and we put an S in front. If it's a critical slope, we put a C in front. But understand that those critical slope is a very unstable situation and doesn't happen very often in nature. If it's a subcritical flow or a subcritical slope, we call it a mild slope, and so we use an M in the front. And then we further categorize by the location relative to normal and critical depth. Case one would be above both normal and critical depth. Case two is between normal and critical depth. And case three is below both normal and critical depth. For a given slope, when you're not at the normal depth, flow will follow one of these profiles depending on where the depth is in relation to normal and critical depth. If you're on a steep slope, it will follow either an S1, S2, or S3 curve. If you're on a mild slope, it will follow either an M1, M2, or M3 curve. If you're on a critical slope, again, this is very, very uncommon, it will follow a C1, C2, or C3 curve. And there are other types of curves, such as horizontal or adverse slope curves. And these are shown in, in Venti Chow's book from 1959. And, and you can find uh, this reference in the resources section of the, of the class. Chow also shows some common transitions from one type of slope to another. Now, there are some steps for sketching water surface profiles, and I've listed them here. First of all, you need to compute the normal and critical depths, d sub n and d sub c. And then you would want to draw normal depth and critical depth in proper position with respect to the bed and with respect to one another. You would then want to establish the proper point of flow control for a given flow regime, whether it's upstream for supercritical or downstream for subcritical. And you would then consider what happens to the depth if the water surface is forced to be in any of the three zones, above both normal and critical, between them, or below both of them. You would then draw the appropriate water surface shape for the appropriate zone that the flow is found to be in. And the basic rules of thumb to follow are that depth will approach normal depth asymptotically. The water surface will want to approach normal depth asymptotically. And it will want to approach critical depth perpendicularly. In the next section, we're going to work through an example problem. Here's an example problem for lesson 13. What you have in front of you is a regular rectangular channel. It has a constant cross-sectional area, but it changes in slope, as you see. It goes from a mild slope to a steep slope and back to a mild slope. Well, what are some things that we know about this? Well, on the mild slope, we know 
that the normal depth has to be greater than the critical depth, and that the downstream end of that reach will